In the middle 1800s, the famous wooden clipper ships that carried American goods around the Horn were built in towns like Essex in the state of Massachusetts. Today, wooden vessels are still preferred by many fishermen, like me, to bring in the mackerel, cod, and halibut from nearby fishing waters and from Newfoundland's Grand Banks. So when a sea captain wants a ship built of wood, exactly to his specifications, he turns to a place where an old craft has been kept alive. He turns to Essex, where men build ships of wood by hand, where more than 3,000 ships have been constructed since the earliest days of settlement in North America. In this village of 1,500 people, men still choose to practice the craft of their forefathers. Ever since the year 1668, seafaring men have come to Essex to have fine vessels built. And here I was, back in Essex at last, for my own ship. looked just the way I'd seen it years before. Of course, there were electric lights and automobiles now, but Essex felt just the same. At last, I was heading for Story's home and office. I'd written Jonathan's story, I was coming, and you see, the Story family has been building ships in Essex for over 100 years. I wanted Jonathan and his men to build me mine. Meeting him again after 30 years was a surprise. It was so natural, like visiting with a neighbor. Plans for my ship, a trawler, had been all drawn up. A scale model had been made. It was perfect, like all the Essex ships. But naturally, I made a few suggestions. My ship, I decided, would be a 70-foot dragger, able to pull 50 ton of fish in a dragnet. And I named her the St. Rosalie. Work began up in the mold loft of Roy Burnham's barn and down in the yards. Lou Story drew the patterns for the ship. Roy Hodges started squaring off the timber for the keel while I settled in at Essex to watch my ship grow. It was time for school to start in the fall, but folks in Essex figure their calendar not so much by the month or season as by the building of the vessels in the shipyards. But of course, boys everywhere have their own calendar for doing things. Now, Dale Cox had ideas of his own. <laughs> yes, but so did truant officer Mitchell. You see, the folks in Essex know they must raise good citizens with good schooling to carry on the shipbuilder's craft, the town's pride. Yes, Dale must learn, as Everett and Lois had learned, it takes a long time for good things to happen. Just as it takes a long time to draft the plans of a ship, exactly the right angle has to be drawn for every rib, for every plank, for that matter if the ship is to be seaworthy. Old Lou knows that. He's seen more than a score of ships launched at the story yards. Story's hand picked the lumber for a ship, and the grain and quality of every piece of wood is keenly estimated for its particular use before one piece is cut. And almost every rib that's cut out for a vessel has its own special angle, shape, and size. Time passes quickly when there's work to be done. By the time the men at the yard started scoffing up the keel and were rolling the pieces into one, the Essex River was teeming with alewives. Just like shipbuilding, alewives are a tradition in Essex. 
Every year, swarms of these herring-like fish come up the river to spawn. Since they rightfully belong to everyone in Essex, privilege to fish them must be purchased from the town. The Board of Selectmen, Woodson, Edgar, Pete Winthrop, elected managers of the town's affairs, choose the highest bid from those submitted. Anyone in town can make a bid. It isn't only the highest bid the selectmen consider. Some years, when the fish are few, no one is permitted to take the alewife from the river. But this year, Louis Miniatis, a newcomer to town, is the lucky winner. In Essex, you see, there's a time for man to take on an extra job. It might surprise a city man to see how the folks in Essex seem to have the knack of doing so many different things. Louis dated the time he had his catch barreled and ready for market as the day the keel of the St. Rosalie was turned. There wasn't a man in the yard that didn't lean through <laughs> that day. In building the ship, it was a great event. The keel is the backbone of a vessel. From here on, you're building up. You see a ship come to life as the ribs are hauled into place. No man in the shipyard has just one job to do. Everyone must turn to a variety of tasks. Even the skilled draftsman lends a hand when block and tackle are put to work. When you see the ribs line up, you can figure how important it is to have accurate designs. Then you can see the products of weeks and weeks of work. The vessel takes shape. Now you can tell how she looks. How oh, she right. That day, the St. Rosalie was a talk of Essie. We were building a ship. I was worrying it together. <laughs> Story and his men were working it. And there was a feeling of play to the work. Bystanders adding their two cents to the men high up on the ribs. Maybe it's because every man in the shipyard takes part in so much that the men of Essex have never wandered down the road a piece the big industrial cities, a bus ride distant. In the factories, they're building too, I guess, but I suspect no factory worker can quite experience the sense of satisfaction an Essex shipbuilder feels. They're worlds apart. Of course, the work at the factories has to be done, and the folks in Essex and all over the United States, for that matter, enjoy the things made in these nearby plants. But the men in Essex choose to live differently. Somehow, at Essex, it seems folks don't figure modern speed is so important. They're satisfied serving a need to us fishermen who want wooden ships. And that means work by hand. It was cold when the planks were steamed, you see. To make the planks fit tight and shape to the hull of a vessel, you have to put them into a steaming box to make them pliable. Then, when they're mighty hot and ready, you take them out and fit them into place. Jonathan's story supervised every step of the operation. Made me more comfortable to know he was always on the job. The planking is the one thing between you and the bottom of the sea. The St. Rosalie was planked with hard pine below her waterline, hard oak above, and the planks were wedged hard and fast. Every piece was set in place with wooden pegs. To me, every peg meant years of working and saving. Though you can understand, I got a thrill watching each blow of the hammer. Besides, this vessel was going to be my home, my cruise home for weeks, months at a stretch. See, the St. Rosalie had to be built just right. And you know, the folks in Essex understand how a skipper feels. Well, now it was spring, or I should say, when the Rosalie planking was nearly done, it was time for me to make my second payment. After first, a formal inspection. <laughs> Well, inspection, <laughs> as if I didn't know just how the St. Rosalie was going along. 
Everyone in the yard was concerned because now the men who were working on the boat would get the first pay. I found dozens of things wrong with the work, just for the benefit of Barney, you understand. I even suggested the ship would sink. I'd paid some cash down when I ordered the vessel. When work was begun, that money went for lumber, tools, plans, and a lot of other such things. Now, when the ship was half done, I was to put up more money. Not just for materials, but for the men's first pay. It was at the time of my inspection of the Rosalie that the folks of Essex were meeting afternoons at the town hall, rehearsing for the annual springtime musical review. As you might expect in Essex, sailors got the center of the stage. is an old tradition in Essex. It still provides a good excuse for neighbors to work together and enjoy their community. When I made my second payment, it was time for celebration. A shutter party, it's called. superstructure was up. Fittings were in. The ship was getting her fancy trimmings. Yes, the St. Rosalie was getting some of the looks by which a skipper at sea would come to know her and respect her as the vessel made at Essex. The decks were cleared. The ship swept away, the ship was tidied up. It was time for the stories to feel proud, too. Grandfather Story had good reason to be pleased with his boy, Jonathan. He'd done a trim job. Everyone at the yard knew how pleased I was. How proud. For there she was, the St. Rosalie with a home port of Gloucester. Well, 
the town planning commission met on the day the Rosalie got her guilt letters, in Essex, almost everybody takes part, one way or another, in running the town. Yes, here, there have always been enough men and women proud of their village to work for it. Without pay, in most cases. The planning commission met because there was some concern about enlarging the town's athletic field. You see, there were some other problems besides building a my ship in Essex. Naturally, if you ask me what to do for children when they're not in school, I'd give you an easy answer. Send them to sea. At last, the great day arrived. The St. Rosalie was all dressed up and ready to be launched. I asked Story how he made the grease to slide the ship into the water, but he wouldn't tell me. It's a great secret with shipbuilders. I dare say every man and woman and child in Essex turned out for the launching. Well, almost everyone. There are only about six or eight launchings a year in Essex, so naturally such an event is regarded as considerably important. Now the pins were being knocked away. The St. Rosalie was ready to slide into the water. Only the christening remained. Unmarried myself, I asked the first mate if his wife would agree to christen the ship. She agreed. For there was the first entry for my ship's log. Mariah, the wife of the first mate, christened the St. Rosalie at Essex. Church bells in Essex were ringing for the St. Rosalie, but it seems there was another reason, too. <laughs> I learned it wasn't only the St. Rosalie was launched that day in Essex, and I found out not everyone went to the Rosalie's launching. Some went to the church instead. But I was proud that in the tradition of Essex, the young couple, Everett and Lois, would always remember that they were married on the day the St. Rosalie was launched. And as we idled down the river to the ocean, and I began to feel the ship under me, I thought to myself, if ever I give up the sea, there's a town where I'd like to live. Of course, I don't intend to give up the sea, but if I ever should, I think it's Essex where I'd make my home. Yeah. 